I just want to go right to the point and talk about uh, some of the issues that I think are standing in the way uh, of this problem. Uh, as was mentioned in the intro, um, I, I need to just present a couple of little points here for background for what I'm going to say in a moment. Uh, I was a graduate student, a graduate student at Cornell University. I did my master's and doctoral dissertation uh, on the question concerning advancing the consumption of more animal protein. That was supposed to be good. Subsequently, I was uh, then uh, responsible for coordinating a program in the Philippines for the State Department uh, when I was at Virginia Tech uh, to uh, basically to develop a model for feeding malnourished children. There, they were supposed to get more protein. And um, we, what I really saw there to, at the time was rather striking uh, in, in a sense that it was almost the opposite of what we we're supposed to do. Here it goes right here. There was a study in India. This is a, a study by uh, people in India looking at the, the effect of protein on the formation of liver cancer uh, in regards to the level of protein intake. I had thought, in fact, in my work in the Philippines that the children who were malnourished, the few who were getting the most protein, not many, just a few, uh, they would have, seemed to have a higher likelihood of getting liver cancer. And so with this study here, I'm showing you here from India at that time, it seemed to coincide with what my impression was, namely when um, people consume more animal protein or protein, it was what was said in those days, the more liver cancer they got. This study here, in fact, shows just a very simple sort of representation of an animal study published in 1968, uh, whereby uh, rats in this particular case exposed to a chemical carcinogen that gives rise to liver cancer, then fed two different levels of protein. What they saw was really striking. Quite frankly, they didn't believe their own research, and I had a hard time believing it too, that the animals fed the higher levels of protein, 20% of total calories, all of them got the liver cancer. The others fed 5%, none did. Striking, really striking. I mean, it suggested rather dramatically that increase in animal protein consumption increased the production of this particular kind of cancer. So I came home, organized a study, went on for many years, decades, in fact, uh, looking at this question, is it really true? Uh, I mean, I didn't quite want to believe that, to be honest about it, but we had to kind of stick with the science with what we saw. And here's this one plot that's uh, relevant to this question. I thought this was pretty striking. Uh, this is basically the development of cancer over the first 12 weeks after the gene has been mutated by that carcinogen. Okay, so we look what we're looking at here over 12 weeks is the growth of the cancer in regard to 20% dietary protein. There it is for 5%. In other words, I was saying the same thing here what the Indian workers had reported that they didn't want to believe. I mean, this again, it's a really striking effect. Then we did some other kinds of studies. And I think in this particular case, many of you may have seen this. Um, I found this here particularly uh, poignant. Uh, animals uh, fed 20% for the first three weeks. They're growing their cancers, if you will. We switched it to 5%. The cancer turned off, turned off, turned off. Uh, in spite of, of the so-called mutation, in spite of the chemical carcinogen. So this was a, a demonstration of the fact that the cancers grew when they were fed the higher levels of protein. And we could turn it on and turn it off just by adjusting protein intake. Once again, that, that was really striking. It suggested for one thing that nutrition rather than genes primarily control cancer development. Another big ticket item, to be honest about it. I mean, diet playing that kind of role instead of the chemicals that started, if you will, or the genes that started. So with all that sort of uh, running around in my head and some others too, my colleagues didn't particularly want to think was smart by going down this particular path to say that animal protein could cause cancer or protein, if you will. So one of the things we did in those days, and still a lot of people do it these days, is in order to explain something that is so striking and so opposing what we tend to think, we have to look for the mechanisms by which this works. And this is my attempt to look at mechanisms. This proceeded over maybe 10, 12, almost 15 years, I guess you could say. Uh, and what I'm going to show you right here is that uh, cancer, from a research point of view, is divided into three parts. The first part is initiation. 
that's when the cancers are forming, right here in the early stages. And then we go through a stage of uh, many months, maybe years, in the case of humans, where, where these uh, new cancer cells that are formed right here, this dotted line, uh, they will, they'll start dividing and dividing, dividing, going forward. And finally, you get to a place where the tumor is noticed. And at that particular point, the second dotted line, that's in the case of humans, that's when they see they've got something and they tend to get diagnosed at that particular point in time. These cancer cells, which have been growing rather well, uh, suddenly decide to get a little mischievous and they go to other tissues, that is the metastasize. So this last stage here is kind of dangerous. The cancer now has spread, as they say, and it needs to be treated quickly. So anyhow, that's, that's the scheme that we researchers use to try to understand cancer. The first stage here, we call it initiation. That's the stage during which the mutation is formed. By mutation, I'm talking about a chemical coming in and binding to the DNA, the stuff of genes, and corrupting the DNA. And we have a way of repairing that almost automatically because it goes on every second of our lives. We have a way of repairing that, and that's called DNA repair. But in any case, that's enough said there. I just want to walk you through some mechanisms. I, at that time, was primarily in pharmacology. I was actually in two professions uh, as far as research is concerned. One was in pharmacology, the other was in nutrition. I don't know why I was <laughs> so silly to have two, two professions at the time, but I was focused on pharmacological approaches to understanding things like cancer. Um, and in that case, we tend to want to work on from a biochemical level to see what's going on. So in any case, after seeing this effect of the protein on the cancer, <clears throat> I was looking for the mechanism. Because if we could find the mechanism responsible for this, then the idea is, at least in pharmacology or in the drug world, we, if we can identify the key mechanism, then we maybe can find a chemical, we'll call it a drug, that we can take and block it. So we don't like it. That's the idea. So I started looking for mechanisms. And this went on to say for some years, uh, usually each one of these uh, studies involves three or four years, and it usually involved a graduate student getting a PhD, some cases a little bit shorter. <clears throat> Here's what we found. Uh, first off, the high protein diet increases the rate at which the carcinogen, you know, that starts things, it increases the rate at which the carcinogen comes into the cell. Okay, that sounded pretty interesting. I mean, when I first sort of saw that, uh, then say, well, why don't we just find some chemical to block its entry into, into the cell? So that was, uh, that was so-called mechanism number one. Then another student came along, we started looking at some other things, and when the carcinogen gets inside of cells, it then is metabolized by an enzyme called mixed function oxidase. That, that enzyme actually, Sorry about that. I'll turn off my phone. Uh, so uh, when when the the, uh, the carcinogen comes into the cell, then it's metabolized to uh, hopefully some detoxified product. But in the process, uh, it it actually forms some. It spins off some nasty little chemical, unintended. That's quite toxic. That enzyme that does all of that is called mixed function oxidase. And it's a very complex enzyme system, by the way, made of different parts. But the high protein diet increased the synthesis of that enzyme. Okay. What that meant is that so if we if it increases the synthesis of that enzyme, then the enzyme is going to be turning on the activation of that carcinogen. It's going to turn on faster, make and and, and the process of turning on that, that reaction. Some of these sort of mischievous sort of side reactions going to occur, some kind of dangerous chemicals spill out. That was uh, mechanism number two. Then we also uh, learned, too, that this ends on being a very complex system made of different parts. It, uh, we learned that, in fact, the, the, all these different parts uh, actually rearrange themselves in a way which also increased the enzyme activity. Once again, the high protein diet rearrange things to make the enzyme producing more active product, if you will. Okay, we got three now. Now at this particular point in time, as I say, that reaction goes forward. It's, it's, it's kind of detoxifying the carcinogen. That's its main purpose. But we get this little side stream coming off the side, this dangerous chemical called an epoxide is forming. That chemical then is so reactive that it essentially binds to the DNA in the cell. 
Now the DNA is the stuff of genes. So when the carcinogen product you know, binds to the DNA, that starts the reaction called a mutation, okay? Just a tight, tightly coupled. The enzyme, I mean, the high protein diet increased the amount of that reactant binding to the DNA. Wow, that was pretty impressive. That was dose response, and so it was really impressive there. That was mechanism number four. Then in turn, usually under normal circumstances, even with we're sitting here talking and so forth and so on, we got this kind of stuff going on all the time, but we got a mechanism in our bodies that's called DNA repair. So that, that, that's another mechanism sitting there to take care of things, kind of fail-safe kind of mechanism. Uh, that's a good one. That should be high. The high-protein diet actually decreased it. I mean, turning all these others on to increase the likelihood of cancer, this is the good one. It's, it actually knocked it down. So then we went to the next stage called promotion. In the second stage here, now, once the cell comes to this first stage to the second stage, most of the the so-called early cancer cells are destroyed. But a little escapes through. And they come out and they come here and they're ready to go. They're called pre-neoplastic. They're, they're, they have the properties of being able to grow into cancer. At that point in time, our immune system comes into play, produces a lot of uh, cells and so forth and so on. Starts to and it, it can kill these early cancer cells. That's the idea. Again, we have that mechanism as a fail set mechanism. We call it natural killer cells coming from the immune system. And so that, it, it's a good thing. We should, those should be produced. The high protein diet, like the DNA repair, it turned out it did something exactly. It decreased those cells. It ruined their ability to be able to kill the cancer cell. Okay. That's, uh, what is that? That's number, that's uh, number uh, seven or number, yeah, six actually. A uh, 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 number of mechanism here. Then the high protein diet comes along and it increases some, and again, a very complicated system, but it increases the blood chemistry in such a way it increases the rate of which these cancer cells divide. Wow, so now the high protein diet turned on these cancer cells, they're dividing, 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 like, you know, that's what I showed here. Then another thing the high protein diet does, it increases the production of what we call free radicals, the oxygen free radicals. These are reactive oxygen species, if there are any biochemists in the crowd, Reactive oxygen species, ROS, those kind of uh, little substances are nasty. They tend to increase aging. They tend to increase cancer. High protein diet increase the production of that too. And the high protein diet increase of this hormone here. This is associated with cancer. Mind you, this was done 30, 40 years ago. So it wasn't much known at that time about any of these things. So I'm looking, I'm saying here, high protein, turn on that enzyme. And then, and the most complicated of all these me mechanisms, the high protein diet changed the way in which calories are used. When, when, and if we have an excess of calories, we tend to spur cancer growth. So again, the high protein diet uh, rearranged all that uh, body of mechanisms. I call it one just for the sake of argument here. Uh, and the high protein diet turned on that to what do we have here? I mean, this is crazy. Um, and to just to quickly summarize, pull something out of the way of my slide here. Um, in, in, in the case of uh, uh, just to give a little picture here of what we just looked at. Um, sorry about that. I'm moving things around here. This uh, unfortunately on my slides is messing me up. <laughs> okay, so I, I just pictured here what I just talked about. Here's the cell in the first instance. This cell here. This is a normal cell. All this business is going on here. The car citizen, and that's the C, comes in. It gets metabolized by an enzyme, and then it binds to the DNA to give this damaged gene. And at this particular point in time, this is repaired under normal circumstances, or it goes on to form early cancers. And, you know, and then one of the first things that happens there, our, our, our body reacts in a way it produces these natural killer cells, you know, to knock out the early cancer cells. By the way, I'm going to come to this later. Natural killer cells are called T cells. This is about you know 35 years ago. Just recently, they've gotten all excited about T cells as if they're just discovered. I'll come back to that in a moment. So I'm just summarizing here. They show you one, two, three, four, five, all these stars. I finally got to a point and said, wow, what's going on here? Which one of these reactions can we hit up with a drug? I mean, that's a pharmacologic approach. That's the way the whole farm, that's the whole drug industry works. 
they find a mechanism, they find some way to stop the re reaction that they don't want to occur, okay? Uh, and so what I, I finally got to a point here where I said, wait a minute, there is no mechanism. We just happen to have, I listed 10 here, there was another two or three I could have listed too. It was very clear that every time we look for a mechanism, we found one. And every one of those mechanisms, whether the, in, the protein was increasing its activity or decreasing it, uh, it increased all the activity that tend to turn on cancer. It decreased the ones that turn, tend to turn it off. I couldn't imagine it. I mean, the odds of that happening, I finally got to a place where I said, wait a minute, this is wrong. There is no such thing as the mechanism, which is a bedrock assumption in the entire pharmaceutical industry. I'll come back to that later. I mean, what this showed me, especially when I started thinking about how these mechanisms all work together, like a symphony, like a great symphony, you know, and, and a thousand times more mechanisms than this, a million times more, everything is working like a symphony there is no mechanism no specific mechanism so that's uh, that's the summary of mechanism i want to show you now that oh, oh yeah i just put showed them here too that this uh natural killer cells these days are called t-cells by the way that they they're working with them now just as if they were just discovered this is done about 35 40 years ago so um okay all that stuff is going on